Amongst my wanderings, the transatlantic settlements have not escaped me, more especially the country of New England, into which our native land has shaken from her lap as a drunkard flings from him his treasures so much that is precious in the eyes of God and his children. There, thousands of our best and most godly men, such as whose righteousness might come between the Almighty and his wrath and prevent the ruin of cities, are content to be the inhabitants of the desert, rather encountering the unenlightened savages than stooping to extinguish under the oppression practised in Britain the light that is within their own minds. There I remained for a time, during the wars which the colony maintained with Philip, a great Indian chief, or Sachem as they were called, who seemed a messenger sent from Satan to Buffeters. His cruelty was great, his dissimulation profound, and the skill and promptitude with which he maintained a desultory and destructive warfare inflicted many dreadful calamities upon the settlement. I was, by chance, at a small village in the woods, more than thirty miles from Boston, and in its situation exceedingly lonely, and surrounded by thickets. Nevertheless, there was no idea of any danger from the Indians at that time, for men trusted to the protection of a considerable body of troops who had taken the field for the protection of the frontier, and who lay, or were supposed to lie, betwixt this hamlet and the enemy's country. But they had to do with a foe whom the devil himself had inspired at once with cunning and cruelty. It was on a Sabbath morning, when we had assembled to take sweet counsel together in our Lord's house. Our temple was but constructed with wooden logs, but when shall the chant of trained hirelings, or the sounding of tin and brass tubes amidst the aisles of a minster, arise so sweetly to heaven, as did the psalm in which we united at once our hearts and our voices? An excellent worthy, who now sleeps in the Lord, Nehemiah Saul's grace, long the companion of my pilgrimage, had just begun to wrestle in prayer, when a woman, with dishevelled hair and disordered looks, entered our chapel in a distracted manner, screaming incessantly, The Indians! The Indians! In that land no man dares separate himself from his defences. Whether in the city or in the field, in the ploughed land or in the forest, men keep beside them their weapons, as did the Jews at the rebuilding of the temple. So we sallied forth with our guns and pikes, and heard the hoop of these incarnate devils, already in possession of a part of the town, and exercising their cruelty upon the few whom weighty causes or indisposition had withheld from public worship. And it was remarked as a judgment, that upon that bloody Sabbath, Adrian Hansen, a Dutchman, a man well enough towards man, but whose mind was altogether given to worldly gain, was shot and scalped as he was summoning his weekly gains in his warehouse. In fine, there was much damage done, and although our arrival and entrance into combat did in some sort put them back, yet being surprised and confused, and having no appointed leader of our band, the devilish enemy shot hard at us, and had some advantage. It was pitiful to hear the screams of women and children, amidst the reports of guns and the whistling of bullets, mixed with the ferocious yells of these savages, which they termed their war hoop. Several houses in the upper part of the village were soon on fire, and the roaring of the flames and the crackling of the great beams as they blazed added to the horrible confusion, while the smoke which the wind drove against us gave farther advantage to the enemy, who fought, as it were, invisible and under cover, while we fell fast by their unerring fire. In this state of confusion, and while we were about to adopt the desperate project of evacuating the village and placing the women and children in the centre of attempting a retreat to the nearest settlement, it pleased heaven to send us unexpected assistance. A tall man, of a reverend appearance, whom no one of us had ever seen before, was suddenly in the midst of us as we hastily agitated the resolution of retreating. His garments were of the skin of the elk, and he wore sword and carried gun. I never saw anything more august than his features, overshaded with locks of grey hair which mingled with a long beard of the same colour. Men and brethren, he said, in a voice like that which turns back the flight, why sink your hearts? Why are you thus disquieted? Fear ye that the God we serve will give you up to yonder heathen dogs? Follow me, and you shall see this day that there is a captain in Israel. He uttered a few brief but distinct orders in the tone of one who was accustomed to command, and such was the influence of his appearance, his mien, his language, and his presence of mind, that he was implicitly obeyed by men who had never seen him until that moment. We were hastily divided, as his orders, into two bodies, one of which maintained the defence of the village with more courage than ever, convinced that the unknown was sent by God to our rescue. At his command, they assumed the best and most sheltered positions for exchanging their deadly fire with the Indians, whilst, under the cover of the smoke, the stranger sallied from the town at the head of the other division of New England men, 
and, fetching a circuit, attacked the Red Warriors in the rear. The surprise, as is usual among savages, had complete effect, for they doubted not that they were assailed in their turn, and placed betwixt two hostile parties by the return of a detachment from the provincial army, the heathens fled in confusion, abandoning the half won village, and leaving behind them such a number of their warriors that their tribe had never recovered its losses. Never shall I forget the figure of our venerable leader, when our men, and not they only, but the women and children of the village, rescued from the tomahawk and scalpel knife, stood crowded around him, yet scarce venturing to approach his person, and more minded, perhaps, to worship him as a descended angel than to thank him as a fellow mortal. Not unto me be the glory, he said. I am but an implement, frail as yourselves, in the hands of him who is strong to deliver. Bring me a cup of water that I may allay my parched throat, ere I say the task of offering thanks where they are most due. I was nearest to him as he spoke, and I gave into his hand the water he requested. At that moment we exchanged glances, and it appeared to me that I recognised a noble friend whom I had long since deemed in glory. But he gave me no time to speak, had speech been prudent. Sinking on his knees, and signing us to obey him, he poured forth a strong and energetic thanksgiving for the turning back of the battle, which, pronounced with a voice loud and clear as a war trumpet, thrilled through the joints and marrows of the hearers. I have heard many an act of devotion in my life, as heaven vouchsafed me grace to profit by them. But such a prayer as this, uttered amid the dead and the dying, with rich tones of mingled triumph and adoration, was beyond them all. It was like the song of the inspired prophetess who dwelt beneath the palm tree between Ramah and Bethel. He was silent, and for a brief space we remained with our faces bent to the earth, no man daring to lift his head. At length we looked up, but our deliverer was no longer amongst us, nor was he ever again seen in the land in which he had rescued.